Hi, um, hi Gayatri and Felix. Um, so nice to have you straight from LA. Thank you. Okay, I guess we can start. Hi everybody, I am Aryan Oligario and I am the Gender Equality and Social Inclusion Advisor for the Earth Journalism Network and I'll be your moderator for today. This webinar has been organized by the Earth Journalis Journalism Network, or EJN, which is a gro global program of the development organization Internews. EJN has a mission to improve the quality and quantity of journalism around the environment sector. And it does so by helping journalists around the world to report on climate change, diversity, conservation, pollution, and other issues by providing story grants, training fellowship, and other kinds of support. EJN is a community of more than 14,000 journalists in about 180 countries. And if you're not a member yet and a journalist, and you'd like to be one, then please visit earthjournalism.net to register. And by registering, you'll be the first to hear about the story grants and events like webinar. So thank you everyone again for joining Earth Journalism's IDEA Talk. IDEA Talk stands for Inclusion, Diversity, Equity, and Accessibility in Environment News Reporting. IDEA Talks, which is held quarterly for journalists with topics that provides you with relevant information in environment news that is inclusive, diverse, and showcasing equitable and accessible solutions led by the marginalized sector. This is a formative talk in which each of the presenter is given about 10 to 15 minutes to present their experiences, their stories in various thematic fields in the environment and its intersection with sex, genders, disability, economic status, and age. This is the second idea talk in the series. And we timed it especially in celebration of Pride Day. So that those celebrating Pride, well, this is your day, Pride Day, and really lobbying for the shifts and changes so that our people in the LGBTQI community and folks deserve the right that they have, especially in my country as well, where I'm based in the Philippines. Today, we have a very special guest that is really working in this, of this environment. At the same time, a proud member of the LGBTQI community. We have Asayas Hernandez and then Arthur from Tacloban, Leite. And in this talk, they will be sharing the LGBTQIA community and the environment, impacts, activism, and paths forward. Looking at that intersection of varying genders and the environment. Following presentation from our speakers, we'll be opening it up to audience questions. For those of you who are watching this live, if there's something that you'd like to ask from any of our speakers, please use the Q&A feature of Zoom, which is at the bottom of your screen and not the chat box. We will be monitoring the Q&A feature more. So please put your questions there. Additionally, this webinar is being recorded, so you'll be able to rewatch or catch any parts you've missed on our website in the next few days. Attendees will also receive an email to watch it. Some reminders to those who are attending. Those who speak English, um, if you don't mind going into the English channel and stay there while those attending who does not want to hear the entire webinar in the Tagal or who wants to hear the webinar in Tagalog, please go to the Tagalog channel. So I'm asking all the attendees to move to the English channel. Our first speaker. Our first speaker is Asayas Hernandez. Unfortunately, there has been changes in his flight and unable to attend today. But I do want to share a video of him um, presenting about climate and how to feature marginalized community in reporting about climate change. So take away, take it away, Rosmi.
Rosmi, can you please recheck the audio? How does queer culture intersect with climate change? Let's talk about it. Marginalized communities are composed of different identities and they are creating new cultures against dominant ecological relations. For instance, when we talk about frontline communities, we have to remember that many Black Indigenous people of color have overlaying identities, just as those who are disabled, those who are undocumented, and those who are queer and trans. The effects of global capitalism and colonialism have left a lot of queer and trans communities at the front lines and being deprived from having access to clean air, water, and soil. But if you look back at history, specifically in the history of resistance and movements, you'll see that there was many queer and trans people. For example, two-spirit environmentalists have always been tending the land and have queer ecologies that have contributed to the regeneration of the land. And it's important to look up to many indigenous environmental heroes that are fighting for climate justice. What are your thoughts on queer communities and climate justice? Let me know. Yes, so we have a very short um, video coming from Isaias, who's an, edu an environment educator using the platform of TikTok, Instagram and YouTube. He actually lives in the Tongva land in Los Angeles, California, and he has actually experienced firsthand how to live on food stamps and his, you know, experience environmental injustice while he's living in those communities. This actually led his path to where he is right now as an educator on environment, lending his voice on important topics such as environmental racism, ethical storytelling, so it's really very important that we begin to explore as journalists ways on how to tell stories that is ethical, focus on the impact of climate change to the varying genders and varying experiences of individuals. So I think that is it for Isaias right now because I want to leave the floor for Arthur. Arthur is based in the Cloban City. And she is a leader born out of the remnants of this big typhoon um, that happened in the Philippines in 20, 2013, Typhoon Haiyan. She has worked as a hairstylist in the global when one of the most extreme typhoon in the world led her to shift her work towards environment, ensuring that her community is organized and led to the justice that they see that environment justice. But I do not want to preempt the story of Arthur and let me give the floor to her for her story. Go ahead, Arthur. Okay. Tolong uh, from uh, Tacloban, uh, one of the biggest resettlement sites in, in Tacloban where uh, the Smith person is living from personal origin, and I am one of them. So I am the president uh, of them here for nine years. So in those nine years, I started um, in temporary settlement site, and uh, what we call uh, re, uh, DRS, that's what we call DRS. That's where I started of where, of, I mean, where I was molded. Uh, because I was just a simple verse person before. I know I have a neighbor. Uh, that's uh, how um, uh, I'm not, I don't know how the neighborhood, that's what they call when the Yolanda came, that's when it started. Uh, since uh, I'm just a little bit, you know, I'm talkative. So they got me as a leader in our community in our community since 2014. On that 2014, on those 11 months that I stayed or lived there, um, almost all, uh, because it's not really, um, I mean, the, the gays or lesbian or LGBT are not, uh, are not uh, uh, treated well. So that's where I, on those 11 months that I stayed there in that temporary settlement site in our um, is that what we call TRS? Um, no one really asked us um, how many is the gays here, 
how many lesbians because we have a livelihood for uh, those people. That's where it is still in my mind that um, on those 11 months that I was a leader there, I never, like everybody that uh, went there, LGO, NGOs, or let's say uh, LGU, uh, they were just asked, Arthur, how many are pregnant here? Is there, we have a livelihood for pregnant. So how many are senior citizens? How many are youth, but never even ask uh, that would say how many are gays here is that we have a livelihood for them here. So for us, like we are just like kind of like shared uh, for the straight people. For example, me, I am a hairdresser. I cannot uh, do carpentry because carpentry, that is mostly uh, the livelihood opportunity that was offered there to us. So how am I? Uh, going to do carpentry or masonry since I am a hairdresser. So there's also like uh, restrages, like uh, fisheries, like in the ocean. Like I cannot really do those because I'm a hairdresser. So that's what really I was thinking that it's not really like exclusive for gays or lesbian, but there should also be project uh, for um, like, so we should not be just like asked to do something or we should also be asked like of what we want. Like, it's like, uh, that's really is for us. So that's uh, what uh, prompt me. It's because of Yolanda. That's really uh, what experienced everything like discrimination, like the CR, like the comfort room. Like one of the problem is the comfort room. Of course, when you go to like the female, oh, you're not a female. If you go to the male, oh, you're not a male. So we're just probably like, you know, like um, looking. Uh, so that is one of the program is hopefully someday uh, because we are one of the vulnerable. If uh, there is a uh, and disaster so that is what instilled to me up until now that i am still the leader um since i become a leader it actually listens so one of the my goal here in the community aside from you so when we are already here in a permanent shelter so there's like a few that discriminate especially me um at first um there is I also have a story. I'm sorry because this is a bit long. I just want to share this one. There is a new uh, comer. So I'm already a president at that time. So it is just a continuous uh, people that's transferring here. So there's one man that uh, uh, just said, like, who is this gay? Why is he like, um, what do you call that one? So it cannot be at ease. So he didn't know that I was the president and that I am the president at that time. So the other man said that, oh, don't say that. You didn't know that he's the president here. So like for me, so, and he asked for an apology. That man asked for an apology. So I was saying, why would you ask apology? How? Uh, what if I am just a simple person? I am not a, a president. So up until there, there is a discrimination if I don't, if I'm not in a position. So we're the same uh, displaced person here. So why would you approach that way? So uh, what is this, uh, you know, what will happen if one member of the LGBTQ, if he doesn't have a position, so it will, the discrimination will be continuous. So that is what I was hoping before that there should be like, um, you know, we will be included. Um, so the rest, so in good thing right now is that we are okay and we are um, acknowledge, being acknowledged. So one of the um, one of one of my project here in our community, and also I'm also thankful and uh, thankful to those who trusted me because I am the first LGBT uh, that is being elected as a president. So right now, like most of the resident here is a little bit uh, so they are more likely to like lgbtq because it started all with me because lgbt leader is good because they were able to focus the community because no children and no uh, family so that is what what their description is so i'm flattered that that's how they accepted me uh, from me and um uh 
the other resettlement sites also adapted that way. Like mostly of the later are precedent in a homeowners association is um, mostly is a member of LGBTQ uh, plus. As actually right now, I am a just new elected federation uh, officer in our homeowners here. So that is one of my uh, goal here in our community is um, uh, to collect plastic. That is uh, one uh, of my focus right now, like what I said, collection of the plastic. So we're going to transform it to uh, resilient or a strong materials for construction. So we're doing it as a hollow, uh, making it a hollow block. So that is our project right now. So that is what I'm focusing. So not 100% uh, plastic free uh, for our community. At least it can listen or decrease the uh, plastic the plastic waste that uh, that just go to the sanitary landfill. So right now we're like five percent or ten percent that uh, segregating the non-valuable plastic waste. Uh, that's like uh, the sachet of um, um, like um, you know chicharia like food or waste in the kitchen waste. So that is our um, what we're focusing right now, and also. Uh, my, uh, oh, those that are here right now, that's here, uh, that you can help me because I cannot really do it all by myself. So we need support. And also like the office, if we're just depending on the officers, we also need um, uh, support so that uh, we can, re it will be really sustainable of uh, what we're fighting for, for our environment. Because you know what we're experiencing, especially um, the you know the um, uh, climate summer. Even though I am LGBTQ, this is my goal or vision in life, not just for myself but for the community and hopefully uh, for the whole world. Uh, uh, is going to benefit of what we're doing, and also about uh, to my co LGBT. Uh, hopefully, we'll help each other help because it's not just for us it's just not uh for ourselves or for others or this is for our nature and most especially for the whole world uh don't just sit around and don't you know uh we should just like do something for others and for everybody and for the whole world thank you very much and good morning Thank you. Thank you so much, Arthur, for that sharing. Um, I really like how you pointed out how, in, how your experience was during the typhoon in Haiyan, wherein there were no opportunities considered for the LGBTQI community, which is really, you know, shocking because they didn't even ask about the needs of the community. Um, even if they surveyed, the questions they didn't ask, is that correct? They didn't even ask, um, you know, what are the needs of the LGBTQI community? Yes, because uh, based from my experience, for me, like, honestly, it's just easy to access. I can easily access it uh, because... Uh, people that I am with the house, I have with the senior citizen with my parents. So it's not going to be hard for uh, me. So what I'm concerned about is that my uh, other, my uh, co-LGBTQ, that is my where my concern is because it's probably going to be hard for them because with livelihood, um, you know, opportunity, I can avail that, but for others, uh, and also the livelihood that they're offering doesn't fit like masonry, fishing, and then uh, carpentry. So that is also, so that is what, why it most, that is my sentimental, ng, uh, also my uh, the other gays that I know uh, that does not really, you know, not too gay, or, but it's still included in the LGBTQ community. So I was just hoping that, you know, they would ask, what do you want? Because, you know, they know that we can't really uh, do all those other works that they are offer offering, so they should be asking us because it's for us and it's us that will be doing it. 
Oh, yes. That's really an excellent point. As part of a way to be more inclusive and, you know, an invitation for journalists to consider when they're reporting to also share the needs of the LGBTQI community. You know, most of the time as journalists, the responses or the news stories that come out are in response to disasters. Um, how was the disaster relief ongoing? But it's, I think what Arthur is really pointing out as well is the importance to also consider in the news and sharing the stories, the, the stories that the LGBTQI community experiences and what opportunities can fit them. And so that they are provided, the folks are provided the needed support that, that they have, especially in the case of Arthur, who is also a caretaker of her parents um, who are both elderly at that time of the, of the typhoon. Um, I also like them, Again, I do want to open for any questions as well for the participants. Please write your questions here. Um, I also want to ask um, you. You pointed out, Arthur, that um, you know when you started the leadership role, other L LGBTQI community members also took the realm. Is that correct? That they also started leading as community leaders. How did that happen? So it's like it started. Uh, so this saw like how I uh, run the community here. And uh, like that was around 2017. Uh, that's when, you know, honestly, it's not like I'm like bragging, but it's like you know, from a president here in Tacloban in recent uh, recent mid-site, just to be honest, I admit that I'm joking, just joking. So I'm just really famous here, like as a president. So that's what opened like our uh, other uh, LGBTQ community. That's where other resettlement like decapit. So why not like we're just appointed this because look at this other habitat because Arthur is the president and he's gay and they really have a nice like, uh, you know, leadership there. Because here I really start here around 2015 here in permanent per resettlement so the vice president is, my vice president is also a gay so after election i was elected again so the vice president is the lesbian this time so the following election again so it was me again so my uh, uh vice president is like the woman so just uh last may so i really doesn't want to run at that time but the people said that they cannot accept a new uh, person that is going to lead because they're not sure that uh, they will be handled, uh, you know, like the right way. So right now, my vice president, again, is a lesbian. So now it opened like it's not really totally like that I would say that accepted, but it's more like um, eye opener for I become a more eye, eye opener for the other side. So it's not probably maybe like that I you know, was leading it the right way. Yes. Salamat. Um, thank you so much, Arthur, for sharing that. Sal I, re I remember in our conversation earlier, prior to this webinar, when you were hesitating to speak and share. But from the story that you're sharing right now, I think it's really valuable that individuals from the LGBTQI community begin to stand up, to be in front, because it inspired. Obviously, you have that experience. It inspired future leaders, um, you know, community leaders to step up regardless of their gender. And yeah, I and remember what they said to you saying, you've done this so many years. And it's so important that you keep standing up regardless of the bashing, regardless of, you know, um, the discrimination, because it does open up the representation of the LGBTQI community if someone stands up. So thank you, Arthur, for, for standing up. Yes. So. Yeah. It's an honor, yes. Like now, 
actually last night i wasn't able to sleep so i woke up like around one i woke up really early so what should i really say so i was like stressing out so i don't know if um they're going to be acceptable if like the participant whatever i have to say so really i was blogging last night i wasn't able to sleep because there's a thing that's going on in the morning because i'm excited but honestly i'm nervous but i was just thinking that um, I also have, um, I have a motto in life that um, when it comes in our community, whatever I do, uh, if I do, uh, if I do it today, I will not do it tomorrow. So I should do it now and not tomorrow. So what I tell myself is I need to do this, not for myself, but for everyone. So I'm not saying that I'm not going to be the, I'm going to be the key here but for me it's just to remind them that there is really something like this that's happening and that that should uh, be happening that sh there should be an equality and it should not be ex exclusive for them that we are also included that whatever the plan is and whatever uh, what should be for ours and our needs uh, also will be meet and we should also be there. Yes, that is true. It's very important that we really voice what you truly need. Just for last question, um, Arthur, we're speaking with journalists right now. Um, if there are any stories that you think that um, journalists should write about the LGBTQI community and the environment, what are those news that you think um, the journalists should begin to discuss, especially in the experiences of the LGBTQI community. Actually, many times that um, it was asked to me uh, to ask, especially to me, that our, our point is to really to have a concrete uh, that they're going to inform the whole world. Yes, there is a, less, a lot of bashing that we're asking for, you know, donations that uh, should, what you know, that there should only be one. Uh, what? Why do we have special treatment? No, we're not asking for special treatment. We're, for us, what we're asking that we should have at least not just for them, but we also have ours because how uh, are we like, uh, you know, moving in our community? Uh, you know, to be honest, the LGBTQ is the best always because they're always the one that's being, uh, you know, limited or there should be an inclusion. So like the servi services, inclusion for everybody and we should be included. That's what we are like, uh, right? There was what, what we want them to write and express to the people that we are here, that we are also people that, uh, you know, like we should be included. And that's my point. Excellent, excellent point, um, Arthur, that, you know, emphasizing that, hey, the LGBTQI community is not asking for special treatment. You and everybody in the community is asking to be heard because everyone is human. And that inclusion matters. And it's such an excellent point to drive out as we conclude this session. So thank you so much, Arthur, for your time today. Um, thank you to all of the participants who came in for this um, enlightening talk on the LGBTQI community and the environment. And again, just as a reminder, as we end this session, you will receive a link to the webinar recording via email in the next few days, which will also include the speaker's presentation and contact information. We'd also like to ask you to please fill out the survey in the chat to provide feedback on the event. So thank you everybody again for joining and have a great day. Thank you everybody. Maraming salamat. Salamat sa lahat ng lumala. Uh, thank you very much to all the participants. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you.